gather here getting near the end of September, which means that we're getting near the end of hurricane season. Has anyone noticed that? Yeah. Praise God for that. We're getting near the end of that. So here in Southwest Florida, that's always something to think about. If you're joining us from home, we are so glad that you have invited us into your house today. And for those who have joined us here in this house of the Lord, welcome. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So praise God for that. Uh, when you came in, if you're on campus, when you came in today, you know blood mobile outside. Um, yes, they are taking walk-ups. You don't necessarily have to have a reservation. As you can well imagine, this time of, of the world situation, especially around Lee County, there's always a need for blood. And so if you feel so moved, you would be able to go there and get a free t-shirt and a free mask. I mean, come on, what more would you want? <laughs> So again, no reservation required. Um, if you'd like to sign up, maybe after you go to one of our Sunday school classes in the other building after this service, you might be able to stagger that in and have no wait, but we just encourage you to, if you're able, to, to stop by the blood mobile there and give some blood to help others in, this, in these days. I want to remind you that next Sunday, right, um, between this service and the 11 o'clock service, we will have a congregational meeting. Now, there's only one thing on our agenda, and that is, follow me here, this is going to get complicated. We are going to seek a nomination, we're going to receive nominations for the nominating team that's going to be nominating our elders, deacons, and trustees. Did everybody follow that? So we're not, we're not electing our new elders, trustee, and deacons next week. We are electing the team that will nominate our future elders, deacon and trustees. Does that make sense? So um, there are five folks that have been recommended to you by the elders. Um, David Carpenter, Elder David Carpenter, Elder Bill, Bill Inslin, um, Al Kaysen, one of our deacons, and um, Candy Engelman, one of our deacons, and Mike Strand, who is a, a layman here in the congregation. To that, from the floor, we can add three others. I'll go into this more into detail next week, but I need you to know that because if you would like to nominate someone to be on that nominating team that will nominate our future officers, right? Um, you need to contact them before next Sunday and ask them to prayerfully consider if they would be willing to serve on that team um, going forward. So, now that I've made it completely confusing, just plan to stay after church for a few minutes next week at, at 10.45, we will have that congregational meeting with the one thing on its agenda, and that is to, to elect a nominating team to nominate folks to serve as our future officers. Make sense? Great. Well, we are so glad to have you with us today, and um, we will uh, direct our attention to the to the video, and then we will enjoy a prelude as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord together. Good morning and welcome to worship at New Hope Presbyterian. We're glad to have you. I want to go ahead and invite you to a very exciting event for women that is happening on Saturday, September 25th, right here on campus. We're one of the host sites for the Priscilla Shire going beyond simulcast. It'll be a day full of dynamic teaching, biblical instruction, worship, and fellowship opportunities for women of all ages from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tickets are only $20 and you can purchase them via our website or using the QR code that you see on the chair in front of you or on the screen. That QR code also allows you to sign in on our friendship pad and sign any prayer request. It allows you to continue giving generously to God's kingdom, or you're welcome to mail a paper check or drop a check in one of the white boxes in the lobby as you exit today. We're very excited to have our new part-time transitional pastor, Ben Borsay, with us to bring the message today. We're very happy you're with us.
as we come together for worship, we need to realize that even the gathering together to worship the Lord is a sign of His grace. If you think of it, when Adam and Eve fell and were cast out from God's presence, the cherub, the angel, stood guard over the tree of life. And they were cast away from any meaningful connection with God. And yet, through the blood and the grace of Jesus Christ, we are called together to approach not only the tree of life, but the Father himself. And so as a representation, if you will, as a reminder that we are called and allowed and given the privilege of worshiping our holy and great God, let us enjoy the call to worship. Glorious and almighty God, ruler of all, you give spiritual food to every soul at the proper time. Feed us and strengthen us so that we, with all your chosen servants, may speak forth your praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us stand together and worship this great King. <laughs>
to be worshipped. You alone are worthy to be adored. You alone are God. And so as your people gathered here today, Father, we bring a sacrifice of praise unto you, our God, our creator, our sustainer, God of the universe. Be pleased in the worship that we bring to you today. May you receive it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our King. Amen and amen. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. Into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life you may be seated. As the church gathered, whether here or at home, we have the opportunity to come before our Lord and Savior not only with the concerns that we see, not only with our personal concerns, but as the body gathered with worship unto him. Let us join our hearts together in praise. Gracious God, we thank you. You remind us through the scriptures, what is man that you are mindful of us? Lord, you are God, you are creator, you are sustainer. You are the author and perfecter of our faith. And so, Father, we approach you as your children, recognizing that we have absolutely no right to approach your holiness apart from the love, the grace, the atoning death, the sacrifice, the shed blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. And yet, Lord, because of that, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence in our hour of need. And so, Lord, we do not come on our own. We come in the blood and the grace of Jesus Christ, your Son. And so, Father, we come to you seeing the needs in our world, asking, Lord, that you would work and submitting to your ways, submitting to your wisdom. And yet we do bring our petitions before you, Father. We pray for brothers and sisters in Afghanistan and other places in the world that to call on your name is in many places a death sentence. Father, raise up your church. Strengthen your church. Father, may they have an Acts 4.29 boldness to proclaim your word. Father, we in our in our more comfortable faith surroundings, Father, would you impress upon us the power of the name of Jesus Christ? Would we be emboldened to share boldly the name of Jesus Christ with all that you bring into our path? Father, you tell us to make the most of every opportunity to proclaim the gospel, and so by your spirit and by our boldness, would we do that as a church and as individuals, Father? The days are near. I pray, Father, that as we see that the fields are ripe unto harvest, that you would use our church, that you would use your people to go into those fields. We pray your spirit to guide that way, to prepare hearts to receive your word. And I pray, Father, that we would share your word with gentleness and respect, but with boldness. Father, we do pray for the, the folks in Haiti that are suffering in ways that we cannot even imagine. And yet, Lord, your spirit is there because you tell us, where can we go from your spirit? 
And so, Father, we pray that you would strengthen the workers, that you would strengthen the brothers and the sisters, that you would give them hope beyond the situation, that you would give them peace, and that that peace would pass all understanding, and that it would be contagious, that you would use this situation there and other places that are upside down, literally, that you would use them to draw glory to your name and people, to your grace. Father, we do pray for our leaders, for our leaders locally, from the school board to elected leaders to others, Father, and just ask that you would give them wisdom in these days. It is so hard to navigate the uncertainties that are all around us. And so, Father, we pray that they would seek you for that wisdom. And that even before they ask, Lord, that you would surround them with advisors that are full of your spirit. Father, we pray that nationally. We pray that locally. We pray that on a state level. We pray that on an international level. Draw these people to yourself, Father. May we continually pray for them. And Lord, even the Taliban that seems so far away from you, Father, as long as there is breath in their lungs, Father, if they are chosen, would you call them to yourself? Would you change hearts, Father? that will lead to changed situations. Father, we do pray for the first responders in our community, for the military around the world, and ask that you would give them a sense of peace, a sense of purpose, a new call to mission. And again, Father, grant them your protection. Father, we thank you for our church. We thank you for the church universal brothers and sisters, believers around the world who are calling upon your name. And we thank you, Lord, that we do not call in vain. We pray for our church, Father, and pray that you would strengthen us, raise us up in this season, in this time, to be your hands and feet, even as we seek your heart. Lord, we are grateful to be your people. May our lives reflect that gratitude. Strengthen us. Bless us. Use us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We come now to a time of confession before our Lord. Let us enter into that time of confession.
me to see my sin and let me see them in your life. Strengthen me also with courage to confess them truly, hiding nothing, excusing nothing, keeping back nothing from my heart. In your great mercy, pardon and absolve, and thus heal me, that I may rise and sin no more. Through the merits and for the sake of Jesus Christ, my Lord and only Savior. May we continue prayer by standing and singing the Lord's Prayer together. assurance of God's free gift of grace and forgiveness. If we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. encouraged to be able to, to share the good news of forgiveness of sin after we try to hit that high note in the Lord's Prayer. It's always comforting to be able to come back with that. I want to remind you as we, as we are reminded to give to this storehouse called New Hope, just some of the ways in which when you give to this storehouse that is used around the world, we partner with missionaries literally around the world through our denomination and through comedy relationships with others to give a portion of what you give when you bring to this storehouse. We are supporting significantly many, many missionaries, but there are three places I want to call out very quickly. This last week we were able to give a couple of thousand dollars to boots-on-the-ground missionaries in Afghanistan. 
ministering there to alleviate some of the needs. We know about the political needs, but with all of those political and governmental upheaval and the anarchy that's following, there are just blatant, blatant needs for food and supplies. And through your giving of your tithes and your offerings, the Lord is allowing us to do that. We've been able to give several thousand dollars to Haiti through Samaritan's Purse there as they are working on the ground to be able to minister to those that we read about, that we hear about, and that sadly have fallen off of the front page of our, of our news coverages because we've moved on to other things, but the needs there are very, very real. We've also been able to give resources up to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi and Louisiana, and um, those funds have actually been able to be doubled um, because of a matching grant that we were able to take advantage of. And so I just want to offer that as an encouragement that when you bring your tithes to the storehouse, the Lord allows us to make impact through other places. And so as you give your tithes and your offerings, I'll remind you that there's four ways that you can do that. There are, are boxes on the way out in the lobby. On the way out, you can drop that in there. You can give online. You can make a check out to New Hope. And there's a fourth way, and I always forget what that is, but you, you know what it is. You've heard it many times. So as we prepare to give, I want to remind you also of the, the special um, opportunity to give to Veritas. Um, if you want to grab one of these little baby bottles and put spare change, checks, anything like that, you can bring that back um, for one more week in the lobby, and we'll make sure that that gets to go there as well. Now let us hear as the choir continues to lead us in worship. so much. It is a blessing. Absolute blessing. Well, if you've been enjoying the cooler temperatures and maybe the rain the last few days, um, you could say that it's part of Hurricane Larry, one of the bands going by our Gulf Coast here. But I prefer to think that it is a gift brought to us by Ben and Kathy Borset, who are coming to us from Findlay, Ohio. And so they brought some of that Ohio fall with them. So we're grateful that they're here. Ben is our new part-time transitional pastor. He'll be starting with us um, on a regular basis uh, beginning in November. But he and Kathy are down this weekend getting sort of set up, getting a chance to meet us and you to meet them. 
you will find that you will love them very, very, very much as we have already. Had never met them before this weekend, but feel like we have old friends. Ben um, and Kathy have been pastoring in the EPC for many, many years. Uh, 36, actually 38 years ago, they moved to Findlay, Ohio to take a small church. And by God's grace and, and the power of the Holy Spirit, that church grew to become over the next 36 years, one of the largest and most influential churches in our denomination. And so praise God for his long tenure of ministry. And we were talking, I said, you've been in ministry a long time. And he said, yeah, it's been wonderful because the church has grown and each season of ministry brings new challenges. And so I've, I've not been in 36 years of the same ministry. It's been 36 years of continually changing ministry. And so he is going to be bringing that perspective, that wisdom, that objectivity to us to come alongside me as we pastor. I'm looking so forward to that, to come alongside the session as we look forward to new seasons of ministry here and to come along us as a pastor as well. A part-timer, you got to remember that. He'll only be here um, 20, 20 or 25 hours a week. Ben went to West Virginia University and um, got one degree there and also got a law degree there as well, studied law. Then from there to Princeton Theological Seminary and then from there to Win Winbriner, Win Webriner, <laughs> another one, another seminary for his doctoral studies. He has been active in denominational ministry, national ministry, as well as within his presbytery, and we are grateful to have you with us, Ben. Come open the word for us. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, good morning, New Hope. And, and again, thank you, Mike, um, and all of you who have been part of greeting us, uh, helping us uh, learn more about Fort Myers, introducing us to uh, your church. Uh, it has been a, a real joy, and we are excited. We look forward to coming alongside uh, New Hope and seeing what God can do in this corner of his world. Uh, it is indeed exciting for uh, for Kathy and for me. Uh, by the way, um, we, we really enjoy Mike, and uh, the more I've gotten to know him, uh, I think of him as the energizer rabbit. Uh, he's moving, moving, going, doing, and, and I'm, I'm exhausted just thinking about all that he has accomplished and all that he takes care of for the church, and I know you appreciate that. Uh, what he's doing uh, usually requires three or four people uh, he is indeed a, an amazing uh, gift from God to the New Hope Church. Let me give you a little more about my background. Kathy and I, and Kathy's out there somewhere. Uh, okay, she can raise a hand. Uh, we've been married 44 years. We have three kids and nine uh, grandchildren. And we come from, as you heard Mike mention, a place called Finley, Ohio. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Finley, Ohio? Raise a hand. Okay, um, that, that's a good representation. Uh, Finley um, is just north of Dayton and south of Toledo on Interstate 75. So you could just get on the interstate and find yourself at some point in Finley. Now, what's Finley famous for? Well, one thing, um, that's, that's the hometown of a guy named Ben Roethlisberger. Now, you can tell who are Steelers fans and who are not, uh, and right now you're thinking, okay, if that's his hometown, and matter of fact, he graduated with my son from Finley High School, uh, you're thinking, you must be a Steelers fan. Well, I was a Steelers fan back in the day when they were perennial cellar dwellers, so I, I came about it long before Ben uh, was the quarterback. And yes, we do cheer for the Steelers or other teams that we cheer for. Uh, I'm more of a college football guy. Uh, West Virginia University being alma mater, I'll cheer for the Mountaineers. Two boys went to uh, Ohio State, and so we do cheer for the, uh, the, the Buckeyes. Uh, and there are other uh, teams that are Big Ten, Midwest type teams that we really like. There, there's another team up in place called Ann Arbor that we don't even mention very much. 
Uh, and, and Kathy and I are not new to Florida. Um, we began ministry um, right out of seminary in Pompano Beach, Florida. Uh, I was on staff of a really big church, uh, a church that had the nickname the Big Pink. And if you've ever been on that coast, uh, you may have seen it. It really stands out. Of course, everything changes over time, and maybe it's not that big and impressive today, but it was literally a big pink church, uh, and that, that's where we began. And then we went to Finley, uh, and we were there for many years, but over time we have, uh, on multiple occasions, been to different parts of Florida. In recent years, um, we've been spending a big part of our, our, our winter uh, in Sarasota. So again, we're familiar with the area. Um, not as familiar with Fort Myers, we're just getting to know Fort Myers, but we know folks here. Um, I, I have a good friend, uh, Bob Welsh, and Bob's out there somewhere. Uh, okay, there's Bob and his lovely wife, Judith. Uh, Bob and I serve on a national committee called uh, Generosity Resources, and when I first met Bob, and this was a few years ago, uh, it was not very long into the conversation that he began bragging about his church, uh, about the great church that he was part of. Uh, he even invited me, uh, probably not with the approval of the, uh, the pastors, he invited me to come down and preach. Um, and uh, that did not happen then. But I, when I got a call uh, back in the spring um, that here was a church uh, that I could come alongside and help with some things, and I realized, wow, that's Bob's church, and he's been inviting me. I guess I do get to come, and so finally I'm here, Bob, preaching. Um, Again, uh, there are other people we know. I'm not going to try to identify different folk here, uh, but it's good to be here, and we're very excited about what God's going to do, and, and what a privilege that I can, with you today, um, share God's truth. And, and the message that uh, I want to do is simply titled, Prayer That Makes a Difference. And I have a clicker here, okay? I've never used one of these, so this may be interesting. We may be seeing scenes from yesterday's football games, but uh, <laughs> I'll try to do this right. Uh, but before we actually get into the study, let's just take a moment and ask the Lord to bless our time in his word. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you have brought us together to worship you, uh, to glorify your son Jesus. We thank you that in our times of worship, we have at the center your son, the living word, but we also spend time in the written word, the, the Bible. We pray now, Father, that as we open scripture, that you're opening our hearts, you're opening our minds, that you may speak to us about those things that are most important to bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, let me, let me get into uh, this conversation about prayer that makes a difference by asking you a personal question. How is your prayer life? Now, the, to help you, uh, think about it in terms of a scale of, of 1 to 10. Uh, 1, uh, perhaps a guy out there right now who last Thanksgiving, your wife said, family's here, we're ready to eat, you say the prayer, you said the prayer, that was the last time you prayed. 10 would be someone who's already prayed two hours and will pray another maybe three hours, uh, and that's pretty typical of, of the day. Uh, and there are days when you, or if you're that person, would pray even more if something's really pressing. So there you have the two opposites. You could be a one, you could be a ten. Where do you land? How is your prayer life? Now, some of you may be thinking, um, Pastor Ben, are you here to talk to us about prayer because someone told you that we just don't pray enough? Well, D.A. Carson says, uh, and I think I've got this somewhere. Uh, well, well, we'll get to it. Pray, we're at prayer that makes a difference. Uh, D.A. Carson, the theologian, says, if you want to embarrass the average Christian, ask them to tell you the details of their personal prayer life. And again, you may be thinking, okay, did, did you hear something about us that we need to, we need to be um, exhorted about praying more? Well, actually, this message is as much, perhaps even more for me than for you. Uh, when I was putting together, constructing the message, I kept thinking, man, I really need to hear this stuff. And so you're going to observe the pastor preaching to him. 
self. The sermon is for me. But why is it that we don't pray as much as we should? One answer would be uh, the idea that I'm too busy. Before I retired, I, I thought, well, you know, after I retire, uh, I'll have more time to pray, uh, to d- study scripture, do other things that are really important. And then I retired, and I found myself even more busy. And some of you out there are saying, yeah, that's, that's been my experience as well. I thought things would change after I retired. Well, no, uh, I can still say I'm too busy. Or, or you may say, uh, life is good. I was in a store the other day and, and looking at a, an array of hats and caps and different kinds of insignias and colors, uh, and, but they all had the words, life is good. And you may say, you know, my life is good. Everything's coming up like it should be. Uh, if I have a problem, I, I know I can pray. And so I don't need to pray because life is good. Some of you, uh, the reason it's hard to pray is because of the pain of unanswered prayer. Uh, you, you may have prayed and prayed and prayed and your loved one still passed away. You may have been praying about your marriage, uh, praying that there could be reconciliation, that you, you, could, you could build a life together, but he never came back. Uh, you may have been praying about things related to your, a business. Um, a business you may have started, uh, that, that, that was uh, your, your dream, uh, and then it hit difficult waters, and you prayed, Lord, rescue my business, and it went under, and that's a painful memory for you. There could be any number of other things. It could be prayers related to health, uh, school, relationships, uh, prayers about church. Uh, some, at some point in your life, uh, you may have been part of a church where things were not going well, uh, there, were, there were difficulties, and you were praying and praying and praying, and things never, never got any better. And so you have that in the back of your mind. Um, I've, I've had lots of unanswered prayer. I, I, I don't know. Now, we can put all these together and, and other ideas as well and put them all under the category of a question that people ask, and that would be, does prayer really make any difference? You know, if God's in charge, he's going to do whatever he wants to do. So why should I bother to pray? Well, if you read Scripture, you'll see that we are being uh, commanded and challenged uh, page after page to be people of prayer. And we're going to see in our passages today uh, a verse where Jesus says, uh, and this is Luke 18, verse 1, uh, where Jesus says, uh, in telling them a parable, uh, that they are to, uh, should always pray and not give up. Always pray, not give up. No matter what has happened, Always pray and not give up. Now, some translations would say always pray and don't lose heart. I like that. Or always pray and never be discouraged. That's God speaking to you and me. Always pray and never give up. So let's look at a couple passages. Um, uh, This will be our primary study. Uh, Luke chapter 11 is where we're going to begin. Two passages we're looking at. Uh, If you're following along in your scripture, uh, you'll see it up on the screen as well. Uh, We begin with um, uh, Luke 11, uh, verses 5 uh, through uh, 8, actually, is what we're going to be reading. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now the next passage is Luke 18, and there we read familiar words. Uh, in Luke 18, and this is also about that which is uh, uh, prayer, beginning in verse 1. 
And I'll read it, although I'm probably already lost and confused. That's okay. Uh, We'll continue moving on here. Uh, Luke uh, Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor, nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. Finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she, was, she would eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says and, and will not bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will, he will see that they get justice and quickly, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth. Now, a couple of things to, uh, to note uh, going on both of these passages. Uh, w- one would be the, the issue of who it is he's speaking to. It's always important to know the audience in Scripture. And he's speaking to the disciples. Uh, he, he's not... Uh, speaking to, as on some occasions, a big crowd. We're not told that he's speaking to the Pharisees or the teachers of the law or, or those who are Greek or Roman. Uh, this is specifically for those who are disciples. And in the context, both of the passages, we're told that he pulled aside his disciples to teach them. Now, this is really important because uh, we live in a world where many people think that, hey, you know, if I need something, I just speak to that guy upstairs. Uh, and he'll certainly answer my prayers if, um, if he likes me. Well, there's nothing in the Bible that says God has to answer the prayer of unbelievers. Now, God is gracious, and he can answer anyone's prayer. He, he can do whatever he wants to do. But the promises about prayer are always connected to those who are his disciples those who belong to him, those who place their confidence in in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Uh, He makes promises again and again that those are prayers that he will indeed answer. Now, the second note is one that's a question that you probably have. Why does Jesus do the same teaching twice? Basically, different parables, but it's the same concept. I, I think it's very straightforward disciples then and disciples now don't grasp what Jesus is communicating, and that is pray always and never give up. Now let's look at um, several things that come out uh, of what would be our um, passages. These are gleanings, not only from here, but other parts of Scripture as well. And the first thing would be that as you pray, prayers that make a difference, you pray helpless. Now, if you look at the, uh, both of the passages, uh, we have people who are in a helpless situation. Here's a guy, middle of the night, somebody comes, uh, company, and it was the, the epitome uh, of rude cultural behavior if you didn't take care of your guests. But, but he doesn't have food in the house. He can't get in a car and drive out to an all-night convenience store somewhere in Fort Myers. Uh, he just doesn't have the provision. And then he has to cross another difficult barrier, and that is to go bother a neighbor. Because in that first century environment, when it was midnight, there were no lights. Everybody was closed in. Doors were locked. Uh, You didn't knock on doors. And here he is knocking on the door. And although he's a neighbor, he's a friend, he doesn't want to help him. And and he says, hey, we're, we're shut down for the night. Don't bother me. His situation is helpless. Now, the widow may be more severe because in that time, widows didn't have a whole lot in the way of rights. Uh, They probably didn't have resources. And judges were notoriously corrupt. Uh, They they lived on the bribes that they got. And here's this poor gal. Uh, What can she do? And she is in a helpless state. Uh, The Norwegian theologian, Ole Halsby, Um, in his writings, uh, comes to this one word, helplessness, as the summary of our heart attitude that God accepts as prayer. And and I quote here, whether it takes a form of words or not, does not mean anything to God 
only to ourselves. He adds, only he who is helpless can truly pray. Another writer, a guy named Leonard Ravenhill, says, God does not answer prayer. God answers desperate prayer. Now, this idea of being helpless doesn't resonate well with most of us. Uh, Our tendency is towards an I can approach to life. I I can take care of this. I I can deal with it. Uh, Some might say that's a, a much more of an American way of looking at things. No, it's universal. Everywhere in the world, people think in terms of, I can take care of this. I remember listening to a a motivational speaker who uh, had been a teacher for many years, and he said one of the things he always did with students was to put up on the chalkboard uh, the words, I can't. And then he would tell them, your goal in life is to take an eraser and erase the apostrophe, and it's no longer I can't, but it's now I can now, I like that. I mean, that's good positive uh, mental attitude. Uh, that, that's good, uh, good uh, mental health. Uh, it's, it's the right thing to apply to your life, to teach your kids. But it is not spiritual reality. You see, in the spiritual realm, uh, we come helpless. The day that you became a believer, you were not having a conversation with God saying, you know, God, I've got some flaws, but basically I'm a pretty good person. I've got a lot of gifts, and I can be a valuable asset to your uh, enterprise. And so if you sign me up, well, the two of us together, we can change the world. No. You began the Christian life, whether you were singing it or not, uh, without the, with those wonderful words, just as I am, without what? Without one plea. That's helplessness. Now, I think uh, that when we talk about something like hell, we're talking about people who have said no to the idea of, of, of being helpless before God. They've said, I, I can do this myself. And on the doors of hell may be written the words self-reliance. Now, you may say, Uh, amen, Pastor Ben, you're absolutely right. People need to be helpless. Uh, You you need to have that attitude when you begin the Christian life. But from then on, uh, you you need to be a major player in what's going on. I mean, God doesn't, uh, it can't can't carry you forever. Well, the reality is the whole of the Christian life needs to be one of our helplessness. Uh, Jesus says uh, in uh, John 15, uh, verse 5, at the end of, uh, end of the verse, apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, prayer, just like the beginning of your Christian life, has to be one of helplessness. You, you don't pray and say, Lord, you know, I've been really getting my act together. I, I've gone to church now like three Sundays in a row. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not kicking the dog as much as I used to. Uh, I'm, I'm really improving my behavior. So I think you, you need to listen to this prayer. No, we come to him and say, oh God, I'm, I'm in a helpless situation. If anything good is going to happen, if these prayers are going to be answered, if, if the kingdom is going to be advanced through my life, it's going to be because of you, not, not because of, of me. So we, we begin the prayer that makes a difference, helpless. It's also important that in our prayers we pray big uh, I, I like that it's an important teaching that we pray big. Uh, our characters, uh, the two characters in the passage that we looked at, we're both praying big. Now, the, the guy who goes to the neighbor, you may think, well, what's such a big deal about asking for three loaves of bread? Well, in that setting, that time period, uh, the loaf of bread he's referencing or talking about would have been a large piece of bread, big enough to feed a whole family. Uh, it was bread that Either you had it in the house or you didn't. And so he's going again to the, to the neighbor requesting something really big. Three loaves of bread to feed his guests. Now the woman, uh, she's going uh, to a judge who had already ruled against her. What she's asking him is to reverse his judgment. And, and she, he probably got a bribe from the other side. And he doesn't really care about this woman. We're told that he, he didn't really care about God or about men or anything else. But, so, but she's coming to him, praying, praying big. 
Now, it's really important at this juncture that we realize that Jesus is not saying that God is like the neighbor or that God is like the judge. God is better. Uh, the, 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 the widow uh, coming to the judge. You and I come to the, the ruler of the universe, the judge of all things. We come to the one who got out of his throne and, and who came into our world, emptying himself, uh, who uh, would take upon himself a human form. Uh, he would live that life that you and I could not live, dying the death that you and I could not die. So as he hung on a cross... Because of his shed blood, uh, he could say, justice has been realized, your sins have been taken care of, I have given myself for you. Radical difference. That's the one we're coming to. Or or, or, or the idea of the neighbor. We're not not coming to a God uh, who is uh, cheap and miserly and doesn't want to help us out. He's the one who's already given us everything. He, he is the bread of life. He has given us that which is his torn flesh so that we could have that life that is everlasting and, 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 and even abundant. You see the difference? Incredibly important when you under, to understand prayer. Uh, one of my favorite verses in Scripture is Romans 8, uh, verse 32, where we read, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Now, that verse should be a banner over your prayer life. That I'm coming to the one who gave up his son. Why would I, why would I think he's not going to answer my prayer? He's already given that which is the most incredible, unbelievable uh, gift. His very son dying for me. That, that ought to be the banner of our prayers. That ought to be at the heart of our prayers. I am coming to my God who loves me, who gave his son Jesus so that I could have life. That should animate our prayer life. There's a wonderful story told about Alexander the Great who who conquered much of what was the ancient world. And when he was at the pinnacle of success, uh, one of his generals uh, came to make a request. And he asked Alexander the Great to pay for his daughter's wedding. Alexander thought about it for a moment and said, all right, uh, I'll pay for it. Just go see my treasure, tell them what you need. Uh, Days later, uh, the treasurer came back and and said to uh, Alexander, you need to arrest that general. You need to punish him. He is taking advantage of you. He's asking for money to finance the biggest wedding in the history of the world. Alexander thought about it for a moment and said, no. You can pay him whatever he asks, because when he came to me, he made two compliments. One compliment was believing that I was wealthy enough to pay for the, for the wedding. And secondly, that, he, that I am generous enough to pay for that wedding. You see, when we're praying big, we come to God and we say, God, you have all the resources Everything is yours, and I believe that, and I believe that you are a gracious God, and so we can pray big. Then we can pray simple. Uh, We see we pray helpless, we pray big, we pray simple, and we see two simple requests. Uh, They're asking for bread. Uh, The woman is asking for justice. Um, Very simple, actually few words, and Jesus talked about the words that you would use uh, when we are praying, and he says in Matthew 6, verse 7, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. He's saying, I don't need to hear all those words. (laughs) I, I, I need to see your heart. You don't need to go on and on and on and on. In, in, in the ancient world, there was, an, there was an idea that if you were praying to one of the gods, and they had many gods, uh, but if you were praying to one of them, you need to, you need to say, have a lot of words. You need to spend a lot of time complimenting the god and praising the god and, 
and saying wonderful things about the God and, 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 and you need to even cry out loud and, and the, the more words and the longer the prayer, more likely that the God would then begin to listen to you. Now Judaism, the, the Jewish religion, had begun to pick some of that up and, and Jewish people began to think in similar terms. And here's Jesus, as he does other places, really blasting his own people, but he's really speaking to us even today and saying, you know, just keep it simple. You don't need all of those words. The problem with praying with too many words is, is an idea that is really works. I have to work my way into God's presence. And, and he needs to hear me saying all the right things and praying and praying, and then maybe he'll listen to me. The Bible teaches us that everything is God coming to us by grace. Amazing grace, what you and I do not deserve. He, he loves upon us. He lavishes us with his amazing grace. Now, that doesn't mean you don't use any words. It doesn't mean that you don't pray with uh, some words. But you need to understand it's not a matter of how well you pray. It's not the performance. It's not how many words. Uh, the real issue is how great is our God. Now, simple is also definite. Uh, a word that I like when I talk about prayer would be specificity. Uh, where you pray and you get real specific. Uh, for example, if you have a son or grandson going off to college, uh, you may pray, oh Lord, help them get a good education, make some nice friends, maybe meet a future spouse. Amen. Well, nothing wrong. Matter of fact, it would be preferable to pray, Lord, my, my, my granddaughter is starting college. And I pray that she will meet right away other Christians, that she'll become part of a Christian group while on campus, that she'll find a good church, that she will continue praying and reading the Bible, that she will grow in her faith. You see how different that is? And the difference, that's specificity, but you're saying, Lord, here's what I'm, I'm praying about and looking for. I think sometimes we're afraid to do that because the fear of exposure Maybe we'll be exposed. People will hear those prayers and then things don't work out the way we're praying and they say, ha, you don't have much relationship with that God you believe in, do you? Or an exposure of God. You know, we're putting God on the spot. We're praying these things. What if he doesn't come through? Better to pray real general. No, everything in Scripture would say pray with specificity, simple. So we're to pray helpless. Uh, we're to pray... Uh, bold, we're to pray simple, and we're to pray persistently. And, and the persistent would be, uh, the, uh, perhaps with the whole script, the, the scripture we're looking at, there, there's the grand theme, that we pray persistently. Uh, and you remember that key verse, Jesus told the disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Uh, I saw the story the other day about a woman named Helen Mollenkopf. Uh, Helen Mollenkopf, um, in 1922, uh, attended a missions conference in New Jersey. Uh, the people who were hosting the missions conference, the speakers, uh, were folks who were putting together a ministry to uh, the nation of Mexico, and their goal was to translate the Bible into the language of different groups, different tribal people living in Mexico. At the end of the conference, they asked uh, if people felt a burden from God uh, to come up and, and get a piece of paper on which should be written a, a particular tribe, and they were asked to pray uh, for the Bible translation for those folk. Well, she came up, she got a piece of paper, on it was written Mazahua, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, uh, but she took that. Uh, she would live out her life. She went to college, became a nurse, um, actually spent more time uh, uh, as a nurse missionary herself. Uh, but all through the years, she continued praying for the Mazahua people and the translation of the Bible. And now that began in 1922. She would retire uh, to Lancaster, Ohio. And in 1970, uh, she felt God lifting the burden. God's saying, you don't need to pray about this anymore. 
A couple years later, she was reading an article about uh, the Wycliffe Bible translators. In the conference she attended was the beginning of Wycliffe, uh, but she uh, had been praying, and she read that this con- the, the work there with those particular people had been a success. They now had a translation of the Bible. She was very excited. She c- c- contacted some of those people, and... Uh, a few weeks later, a couple of them came to visit her, and they brought to her a, a copy uh, of the New Testament in the language of that tribe. Exciting time to get together. Uh, she was thrilled with what had happened, and she asked them, when did you finish the translation? Remember the year that she decided or felt God saying, you don't need to pray about it anymore, 1970? Well, they told her, well, the translation was finished in 1970. (laughs) She'd been praying for almost 48 years. You may be out there saying, you know, I've been praying about something now probably 48 days, 48 weeks, 48 years, maybe 40 years. Jesus says, never give up. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Continue to be faithful and persistent in your prayers. God answers prayer. Now, the reason that story was attractive to me, and you'll learn more about my family over time, but uh, we have a daughter. um, I should probably get my wife to come up and finish. But we have a daughter who is a Bible translator. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Um, She and husband and kids are in Cameroon, Africa. And they're working with a people called Baka. Translating their language. The fact I'm going to take advantage of my being up here and asking you to remember. Now, don't don't expect me to uh, get all emotional every time I preach. But this is my heart, and it's your heart too, because I know this is. Mission Center Church. That's exciting. But if you remember Baca, B A K A, easy to remember. Uh, write it down. Pray for that translation. And in maybe years down the road, someday you'll meet my daughter in heaven and you'll ask what happened. And, and I, my conviction and hope is that she'll say, We, we got it done. And there were many people in West Africa who came to know. We pray helpless, we pray big, we pray simple. And finally, we pray joyfully. And here you may say, well, I don't see that connection. Well, we know that everywhere in Scripture we're told to be joyful, to rejoice, to uh, be people of joy. That's our signature. We are, are joyful. Uh, a couple weeks ago, you, you were blessed with a wonderful series of messages, and, and I've been following New Hope now for a while, uh, listening to what you guys are doing, and it was a great series of, of sermons on Habakkuk, um, and, pa- and the pastor um, was teaching about that which is joyfulness, Let me pick up the verses at the end of Habakkuk, uh, chapter 3, verses 17 and uh, and 19. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. 
He enables me to go on the height. Here's someone, and this is probably the most beautiful picture of faith in the Bible. It's the most wonderful prayer. Because he's basically saying, there's nothing left. We've lost everything. But he wants to rejoice in God because his confidence is in Jesus Christ. He he continues to have this incredible faith. He is praying joyfully. And that's my encouragement for you, for us, that we would be a people who pray in a way that makes a difference, that we pray helpless, that we pray big, that we pray simple, that we are persistent in prayer, and that we are always joyful in our prayers. Let's bow our heads and hearts. Father God, we thank you that the good news has changed our lives, that the good news is our news for this part of your creation and for the whole world. May may we be faithful in season and out of season in proclaiming Jesus as Savior. And Lord, help us to remember that we are to pray always and never, never, never give up. That Jesus Christ may be glorified. Amen. Let's stand and we're going to be singing that great old hymn. Uh... Now may the love of God, our Father, the grace of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.